heart and life to Jesus that He will definitely uh, turn it upside down and change it for the better. I praise Him uh, today for His goodness. Uh, we're going to jump right on in this morning. Um, if you will, I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to look at a very familiar passage of Scripture. As you can see, uh, today is a, a Sunday that we're going to celebrate uh, what some call the Lord's Supper, some call the Communion. Uh, but today I'm on, we're going to look at it. I hope I can, I hope if we uh, can accomplish here today what I feel like the Lord laid on our heart to accomplish, uh, we're going to hopefully leave here looking at what we call the Lord's Supper and what we uh, call communion in a total, totally different light uh, today, hopefully. So um, let's find our places there. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. When you find your places, you can stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. All right. All right. The Scripture reads, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which He was betrayed, took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, Take, eat, this is My body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of Me. After the same manner also He took the cup when He had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in My blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till He come. Father, we love You and we thank You, Lord, for Your Word this morning. We thank You, Lord, for the presence of the Holy Spirit. We thank You, Lord, for the uh, conviction and correction and uh, comforting power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And God, we pray today that You would just uh, teach us more, a, a deeper revelation of Your Word, God, that would help us in our Christian lives and would help us, Lord, uh, most of all, to, to lift the name of Jesus even higher than what we have in our lives. We praise You today, and we ask You, God, once again, to give us the anointing, Lord, that makes preaching effective, and we'll be careful to praise You for it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. In 1962, there was a man named Thomas Kuhn, and he wrote a book, uh, more actually it was a series of about three books, and it was called The Structure of Scientific Revolution. Now when he wrote this book, what he was, there was something that he was specifically talking about, something that some of you may have heard of and some may have not. It's, a, it's one of those things that really have a simple meaning, but we try to make it sound a lot smarter than it really is. Um, Y'all don't know anything about that, do you? All right, so it was called a, a paradigm shift. Have any of us ever heard of what a paradigm shift is? You know what that is? And the, the actual definition of that is a fundamental change in an approach or underlying assumption. That sounds pretty smart, don't it? Uh, but it's really it's real simple. It goes on and that says it's where one conceptual worldview is replaced by another. All right, now here is my, here's my definition. It is the act of taking the same information and looking at it in a different way. That's, a, that's more on my level right there. That other gibberish I might not know a whole lot about. But taking the same information and looking at it in a different way. And I want you to know it's not a mild, a mild change. This is something like a revolution. And we're talking about something that will change a situation or change your life or even change a church or change a community in a dramatic fashion. Just something that the world can see. And I'm going to give you some examples that um, uh, some of these things he talked about in his book, but I think that um, I want to apply this to our world today. So I want to give you just a few examples. You can take... Things like DNA and genetic codes. When that, those things, DNA changed science dramatically when they looked at it in a different way. Um, this new information that they gained uh, just changed the way that many things were done. It changed the medical field. It changed the way that that heart and 
kidney transplants and things like that were prepared for and how matches were found and all that type of stuff. It just changed, it changed the criminal justice field. When, uh, when they began to look at DNA and genetic codes in a different way, um, there were cases that were reopened. Um, it changed the way that crime scenes were being investigated and things like that. It just made a lot... The world of science went through what is called a paradigm shift. And let me say, because of, the, of that discovery and exactly how to use DNA and genetic codes in a deeper way. Now, in October 31st, uh, 1517, Martin Luther nailed what we know as the, uh, uh, the during the Protestant uh, Reformation, he nailed on the door of the church at Wittenberg, Germany, the 95 Thesis. What we is called the 95 Thesis, which talked about justification by faith and not by works. Or justification by faith and not by, and I'm going to put it like this, not by the uh, uh, stepping in of a priest. That you no longer had to go to a priest and was one of the results of this to, uh, to ask forgiveness of sins or for Him to represent you for God, uh, before God. Let me say, this was a realization that what Jesus did on the cross gave you access into everything that God has and everything that God is because of the fact that Jesus rose again the third day and gave us an opportunity or gave us access to newness of life and everything that He is. Uh, in the 1990s, businesses began to talk about paradigm shifts. When the internet and computers and all those things come along, it totally changed the way that companies did business. You can look back in our own lives. You know, people don't know what to do today without a cell phone, but I can remember days when there was no cell phone. You know, I can, boy, wasn't them some good days. Amen. <laughs> Let me tell you something. I can remember when, you know, as, as somebody that uh, ran their own business, and I'm sure a lot of you deal with this, I didn't have to worry about 9,000 phone calls during the day. When I got home in the evening, I'd check my message. You know, that was on my answering machine, and then I would call those people back. You know, there wasn't interruptions all day. Cell phones changed. You know, it was like a paradigm shift. It changed our world. And now we see kids, three, four, five and years old, five years old, walking around with cell phones, playing games and talking and knowing more about them than we do. Isn't that amazing? Things like that changed our world. In the, in the 1970s and also in the 1980s, society went through a paradigm shift. And they did that because of the gay rights movement. And then through that, you know, look what it's developed into today. That today if you say something's wrong with it, you know, you're, you're being judgmental or you're, being, you're on the wrong side. You know, but folks, it doesn't matter what you say about it. I'm just going to go ahead and share that with you because God is absolute truth and what He said about it has already been said and that's what it is. Amen. And sin is sin and I don't care if it's my sin or your sin or whoever's sin. It's sin. You can't change the definition of what it is when God has spoke what it is. It totally changed the way that our world is looked at. In the 2000s, I think, um, you know, and we're in this time now, to all the way uh, through what we're going through now, I think the church is going through a paradigm shift. And the reason being is because churches now want to be seeker friendly instead of Jesus friendly. We want to please the people instead of pleasing God. We want to do everything to try to accommodate you and to try to keep you happy and try to not have controversy and all those type of things. But let me tell you something. There's really only one that needs pleasing in the church. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we learn how to please Him, let me tell you, those that are right with God will be pleased. And those that are not right with God hopefully will get right with God. And if they're not, they're going to find somewhere else to go. Amen. Amen. That's just the way that it is. 
The church is going through a paradigm shift and we are trying to change our music to accommodate the world. We're trying to change the way we socialize to to accommodate the world. We're trying to change our morals and our standards to accommodate the world. And let me say, and we serve in churches today where there's no accountability anymore. You do whatever you want to do, hold whatever position you want to hold, and let me say, we just don't want to make you mad. Folks, let me tell you something. There's not but one today that I, that I want to uh, please to, uh, the, uh, to the uttermost. And let me say, I know if I pl- He's the one, let me just put it this way, He's the one i got to stand before when this thing's all over. Paradigm shifts will affect all areas of your everyday life. It changes the perception of the way you see everything. And when we get into this Scripture that we read here this morning, what was going on is the disciples were going through a paradigm shift. Christ was, uh, Paul was teaching them these things that Christ had said uh, here to the church at Corinth and Um, See, they were being told to look at old information. They were being told, Paul was telling them to look at old information. Something that they had heard their whole uh, Christian life. Something that they had heard when they walked with Jesus. Something that had been going through the church about partaking of what we call communion or the Lord's Supper. And they were told to look at it in a totally different way. And it was going to totally change of their lives. And the reason I say that because it was going to take them from religion to relationship. Folks, and that's what we want. We want to, we want to move from religion. We want to move from, um, you know, your, your run of the mill Baptist church. We want to uh, come into a place where our relationship is so great with the Lord and we understand His Word and why He said the things He said the way He said them in such a way that when people pull up in the parking lot of Union Grove Baptist Church, they can feel the presence of the Lord. Let me say, folks, and when through when that happens, lives will begin to change. They were given a new perspective. When you're given a new perspective of something, it'll give new meaning to your purpose, a new meaning to your life, and a different kind of perception will bring about different results in your life. You've all heard, I know, the meaning or the definition of insanity. It's to continue doing the same thing and expect a different result. Folks, and I'm just going to go ahead and share some stuff with you this morning that maybe I shouldn't, but I am anyway. Uh, Let me say, you know, know, uh, there's been changes that have went on in the church. And I want to just go ahead and tell you, I'm not the author of all those changes. You know, now I understand as the pastor, I do receive the credit for it, good or bad, a lot of times. And when there's changes within the church, a lot of times when people say, well, the preacher's trying to change everything. Folks, let me just tell you, there's some things need change. And folks, and what's happening is some of the people are changing, and because of their changes, things are changing within the church. And praise God, if I take the, the good for it or I take the bad for it, I'm just glad to see that God's working. Amen. Amen. And you know what? I'm also seeing some different results. So let me say, when you go through those shifts in life, And those changes that take place, especially your way of thinking about old information in a new way. Most of the time, it's a good thing. Especially in the church body. See, but as human beings, and we've all got it in us, we've got a tendency to hold on to the familiar. Hold on to what we're used to. You know, do things the way we always have. All that kind of stuff. But folk, the fact is, is that when we're faced with biblical truth, even if it's new truth, we have to make a decision. Will we stay limited based on the familiar? Do we think this is all? Do we think all that's to this scripture that I read this morning that we have heard over and over and over and over and over in our lives? 
Do we think that's, that's all there is to it? Is that it's just words on a page? It's just what we read when we do communion? Or do we believe that this Word of God is alive and it's well and every time we read it, it should mean more to us and it should in, encourage us and it should set our, in our spiritual lives on another level and bring us closer uh, to the power of God in our church? Look, we, got a, we can either stay limited based on the familiar or we can step out on a new revelation of old truth. And I want to step out on a new revelation of old truth. I'm going to give you a biblical example to show you what I'm talking about. Y'all remember Peter in the Bible? Hard-headed Peter. Boy, ain't Peter, Peter something else, ain't he? How many of y'all feel like you act like Peter sometimes? Amen. Boy, I tell you what, if there's one disciple, I'm the hard-headed one too, just like him. You know, just like him. Wants, you know, just wear your feelings on your sleeve, do what you feel, say what, what the first thing. Don't even, let me say, speak before you think. Y'all know how that goes? That's exactly who Peter was. But isn't it amazing how he's the very one that God chose to lead the disciple? You know what it was? Because he didn't take time to analyze it. He just knew that he loved Jesus and he was going to do whatever he felt like Jesus needed done for the kingdom of God. Now, Peter, when he, y'all remember when he stepped out of the boat and walked on the water for just a little while? This, in this, his, see, Peter was very familiar with boats and Peter was very familiar with what? He was a fisherman. We know that. Him and his brother Andrew. On the fishing company, if you want to say that. So he was very familiar with boats. He was very familiar with water. There's no, play, no doubt in my mind that he was, had been through many storms in his fishing trips. And this big storm blew up, you know, and, and the disciples were afraid. And you know, the familiar, what the familiar thing, what Peter knew was that the safest place during a storm when you're in a boat on the water and the waves and seas are roaring, the safest place tells them to stay in the boat, doesn't it? But did he? No, he went again. He took, he took old truth. Look, he took old truth and he began to look at it in a different way. And the reason he looked at it in a different way is because Jesus called him to walk out on the water. And Jesus is what made the difference. Jesus is what made him step out in faith. And because of his relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, he got to experience something that the other eleven never got to experience. Folks, because he didn't, he didn't harp on the familiar. He didn't get hung on the familiar. He would have missed one of the greatest opportunities and experiences in his life. He would not have got to experience the supernatural power of God in that instance. Look, he had to forsake all that he knew before about water and boats because of what he knew about Jesus. And he had to allow his perception of who Jesus was to become bigger than his circumstance. And that's exactly what he did. Look, it's evident that you can't step out on the water of new truth and still be thinking back in the boat. Folks, you've got, you got to... Um, I look at it like this, you know, if uh, you got to jump. If Jesus calls you out, if Jesus is encouraging you, if Jesus is doing a new thing in your life, you got to be all in. You ain't the churches will not, and individual Christians will not get anywhere being halfway in and halfway out. I'll tell you where they'll get. They'll get miserable. You've got to be all in. Now, in this scripture that we read, as I said this morning. To us, this is a communion text. But now see, to the disciples, this was a celebration meal of the Passover. Right? Y'all know that out of the Scripture. Every year when they would get together and partake of what we call the Lord's Supper, what it was is that it was a celebration 
of Jesus bringing the of God bringing the nation of Israel out of bondage of Egypt. You know, under Pharaoh's rule. That, and we know how that uh, Jesus, uh, that God sent uh, the death angel and that, you know, they told him to put the blood on the doorpost and all that. And when the death angel came by their house, if the door was on the lintel and the doorpost, that the death angel would pass over them, right? And that's where we get the Passover. And to the disciples, this wasn't communion. To the disciples, this was the celebration meal of the Passover. But now here in this Scripture, Paul, and through what Jesus has taught about this, when Jesus took the bread and broke it, the disciples went through a paradigm shift because the Passover took on a new meaning. It's old truth. It wasn't wrong. It was exactly what they had done with it and exactly what they have known and the familiar and what they had been doing with it for a while. But Jesus was telling them, take this and look at it in a different way. And in order for us to progress, church, as Christians, we've got to be willing to forsake our old way of thinking. We've got to be willing to forsake our old way of thinking. Let me tell you, a mature Christian doesn't think like a babe in Christ. A mature Christian thinks on the things of God and the precepts of God and the uh, commandments of the Lord and all those things and does His best. Yeah, I realize it's not all about the do's and don'ts, but what I can tell you is when you get the relationship right with the Lord, you'll fulfill a whole lot more of the do's and don'ts. Because it's fulfilling the law, just like Christ said, I came not to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. Folks, and that is our purpose. We are supposed to be Christ-like. So in us, as our relationship grows and builds with Christ, we too will not do away with the law in our lives, but we'll begin to fulfill the law in our lives. Does that make sense to you? And by doing that, we become more like Him. Look, so I'll just ask you, I'll tell you what, just look at your neighbor this morning. Neighbor, are you going to stay in the boat? Are you going to jump? Or are you going to jump? Look, I jumped, I jumped about 15 years ago, or 14 years ago when the Lord called me to preach. Not educated. Let me tell you, I didn't know the Bible, but I knew I had a calling in my life. You begin to build on the relationship, God will take care of all that other stuff. Just work on the relationship. Folks, it's all about the relationship. It ain't about religion. Look, in one sentence, in one sentence, Everything that the disciples knew and everything that they had experienced concerning Passover changed. Just like that. In one sentence. They were asked to forget it. And folks, I'm telling you, new wine, as the Bible says, can't be put in old bottles. We've got to allow the Lord to do what He wants to do in us. Now the word communion means this. The sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially on a spiritual level. In 1 Corinthians, and I'm not going to read this to you, but in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 15 through 17, well, I'll tell you what, let me do read this. Let me read it. 1 Corinthians 10, just back a page or two, 15 through 17. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. He says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? What he's talking, he's not talking about a ceremony right there. He's talking about a relationship. Remember when in John chapter 6, Jesus told His disciples, He said, if you will not drink of My blood and eat of My flesh, you cannot be my disciple. 
He wasn't talking about them literally drinking His blood and eating of His flesh. He was talking about if you will not be a partaker, if you will not love Me in that kind of way, if you will not fellowship not only with Me in the great things, but if you will not fellowship with Me in My suffering, you cannot be My disciple. He tells us in other scriptures, you cannot sit at the table, the table of devils and sit at the table of God at the same time. He says, look, if you want to glory with me, you're going to have to suffer with me. And what he means by that is that, folks, we're going to have to put away uh, who we are. We're going to have to uh, put away because we all are still dealing with that flesh that is inside of us. Yes, the Bible says the Spirit is willing indeed, but the flesh is weak. Folks, let me tell you, so we're dealing with that flesh. He's not. He was sinless. Sinless perfection, so He knows what's best for us, and He knows better than we know what's best for us. And that's why He gives it to us in the Scripture, and He's telling us, folks, you can count it in your family, or you can count it in your church, or you can count it in your community. Let me tell you something, if you follow the Word of God, people are not going to like you. Amen! Amen! People in your church ain't going to like you. Amen. I'm telling you, I'm giving you some truth this morning. Will we accept the truth this morning? Let me tell you something. If you follow the Word of God, sometimes you're going to rob people the wrong way. Jesus said, He said, I came not to judge the world. I came to save the world. He said, My Word will judge the world. Folks, I'm telling you, this right here is the biggest cause of separation in any church in the United States. This right here is the reason churches split. It ain't because of the color of the carpet. It ain't because of the kind of windows I want it to get put in. It's because some of you people want to follow this and some people want to follow their instincts. When we get a hold of this, praise God, and we begin to serve this, and we begin to live this thing out, we'll begin to see the things that the disciples of the Lord seen because of their relationship. Get out of religion. Look, participation in the Lord's Supper, it identifies us as a worshiper of the Lord. And I'm not going to go too deep into that because I want, I'm going to, I'll put it like this. Is, I guess this is what they call on TV, a teaser. I'll tell you what a worshiper of the Lord is that night at Baptist Chapel. So you come on out there and find out what it is. A, what a biblical worshiper of the Lord. Folks, He gave it all. He gave it all. He didn't have to. You know, have you ever thought about that? We always talk about Jesus dying on the cross for us. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave, right? His only begotten Son. But have you ever thought about the fact that what if Jesus would have said no? You think He had that choice? He was God. He was equal with God. He was willing to die for us. And as much as as man at that time had wronged him, as much as he was misunderstood of man at that time, he died on the cross anyway. And then as he looked into the future, And he saw us. All of us. And knew how we would reject Him. And knew how the world would despise Him. And knew how that even His people who were trying to serve Him and love Him and live for Him would be mocked and made fun of and pushed to the ground and pushed to the side. 
And how the, His church, the establishment, if you want to call it the organization, because the church should be a little organized. The organization that God brought together to tell people about Him and share His love and share His power the, should be the, uh, the example to the world. The people who should be the example to the world and the example to those that come into the house of God and knew that we would compromise His standard. Just that we would go along to get along. And he said, you know what? I'm still willing to die for it. I don't know about you, but that's pretty amazing to me. That's God's amazing grace. In His mercy. Maybe you hadn't done what I've done. Maybe you hadn't lived like I've lived. For oh so many years till I was in my early 30's. Let me tell you, if that's not a picture of the mercy of God, I don't know what is. But thank God, we are justified by faith. Therefore, we have access into His grace. And the Bible actually says, in Romans chapter 5, it says it like this, we have access into this grace in which we stand. I stand today in His amazing grace. When I step out of the boat, like Peter did, see, Peter was stepping out on the water. Today, as a follower of Christ, when I step out in faith, I step out onto His grace. And by His grace, He holds us up. He keeps us afloat. And as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, church, let me tell you something. We'll walk on the water. The storm ain't going to go nowhere. The storm's still going to be right there where it was. The waves going to be all around you. People still going to be people. Church people still going to be church people. Church people are some of the meanest people in the world. I was telling somebody this the other day. Y'all don't believe that? Church people are some of the meanest people in the world. And I, must, and I love you all. Praise God, I don't know you that well. Church people are some of the dumbest people in the world either. Hey, I clued myself in that. And the reason being is because we've got the greatest teacher of the world and we still don't get it. We still let's stand this morning if you will. <coughs> Hymn number three thirty four this morning. The Lord has spoken to your heart. We want to invite you to come this morning. Folks, our desire, if you're here this morning and you're a Christian, our desire every time we walk into this house should be to draw closer to God. Our time, that every time we walk into this house, and this, if you just come to worship service this hour, or it's been an hour, this hour that we have spent together, should have not been about what the preacher said. It should be about what the Holy Spirit has spoken into your heart. Now maybe he uses a man sometimes to, he does use a man to present his message. But if all you heard is what the man said, you're going to leave here the same way you came. But if you'll hear what he says today, you can leave here different in a positive. I pray that God will continue to grow us as individuals. I pray that God will continue to change things in this church. Spirit. And I pray that we I pray that we will continue to be uncomfortable. Because when we get comfortable, I think we've been comfortable too long. When we get comfortable, that's when we start getting away from this right here. 
Because this is challenging. Because God said my words are spirit and they are life. Folks, and it's our life. You come today, please, spoken to your heart.
<clears throat> All right, I want to I want to say before we uh, get started with this, um, Ashley, stand up, baby. Let me just uh, Ashley come and she asked the Lord to come into her heart today. Amen. We praise the Lord for that. Amen. That's good. And I tell you what's so awesome is um, the knowledge that she has that has been instilled in her life of what Christ is. And I guarantee you, this is a good girl right here. Y'all believe that? But she realized this morning that being good ain't good enough. Let me say that. And that we all need a Savior. And praise God she got one this morning. <laughs> Amen. We love you, girl. Amen. We take it back at the end. We definitely appreciate you coming out this morning, and we, um, I really have no right or wrong way of doing communion because I do, uh, you know, feel like there is no right or wrong way as long as you lift up the name of Jesus in it. Um, so today we're going to, uh, you know, this is your deacon's uh, minus one. I think Brother Eskel had to work today. Uh, but, you know, a couple of these guys are going to be rolling off, but... I want to say, uh, let's see, out of these, it'll be Brother Earl and uh, Jamie that's rolling off of the ones, and um, Rick. Um, Y'all continue to pray for them. Uh, continue to pray for them because, you know, a, a guy stays off one year and he has, you know, can possibly come back on in another year if he's voted on. But, folks, I'm telling you, you can't, I can't stress enough how important church leadership is. And... Um, the, uh, the guys that are your deacons, they're first of all servants. Servants. You know, and I think these men understand that um, from our conversations and things we've talked about and just the way they deal with God. There's no doubt. I think they understand the fact that they're servants. But the, but the reality of the matter is they're also decision makers in bringing stuff before the church and what needs to come before the church in financial matters and spiritual matters. Folks, I'm telling you, first of all, I desire your prayers. And then secondly, I desire your prayers for all of these men as we meet and we talk about these things that God would always, that we would always listen to God and that we would always use this as our rule and for our direction. And so I just ask you that this morning to continue to pray for them. Um, I'm just going, uh, we're going to be very informal this morning. Uh, Brother Gary, I'm going to ask y'all to uh, if you'll take care of you and Tommy take care of this side. There you go. You and Mike take care of this side. Come on, Mike. Y'all can take care of this side. I'm going to give you one. We need downstairs, right? Here. serve a mighty awesome Savior, y'all. He's definitely worthy to be praised, worthy to be worshipped, live for. He died so that we could live. 
way of life of both. Steve, if you will, bless the bread this morning. Father God, we thank you for so much for the new covenant we have, Lord. We yes. Share from our faith in Jesus Christ, Lord. We give you your body to us, Lord. We thank you so much for that. There's nothing we've done that you did for us. Amen. Lord. We thank you for the worship of you and pray in your name. Amen. And the scripture says that he said, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me.
In Leviticus 17.11, it's a, a passage of scripture that, you know, Leviticus being the book of law, and it says in that uh, verse of scripture, it says the life of the flesh is in the blood. And that it was talking about the physical life and blood being what it takes to give us life. Uh, but because of the new covenant uh, that Steve just uh, thanked God for and prayed for, because of that new covenant, that takes on a spiritual meaning. That the life, you know, the life, to give this old fleshly body life, and life abundantly like Christ takes, like Christ talks about, it takes the blood. It takes the blood of what Jesus did. And for us to be covered in that blood. Now in the scripture, um, this is what he said concerning this. He said, um, in 1 Corinthians, we read this morning, he said, after the same manner, after the bread, he also took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. I want us to go ahead and drink, and then we're going to have a prayer. God has given us such great opportunity, folks, um, first as individuals, Christians, to access everything that He is, everything, all of His power, all of His love, all of His mercy, all of His grace. God has given our family, each individual family, that same access. And God has given this church that same access. Folks, we have such a great opportunity. The kind of opportunity that Peter had when God said, Peter, come out here on the water. That's where we're at. Do y'all realize that we're at that crossroads? We're at that place of decision where we can decide if we want to stay here safe in the boat. Or we can stay here just like it is for the rest of our lives. Uh, we can step out on the boat and see that there's more and be in the hand of God. And folks, it's all going to be because of this blood, because of the blood of Jesus. Being a partaker of that blood, like he said, if you will drink my blood. Christ told some of his disciples, and I wish I'd have looked this scripture up and give it to you. I will maybe the next time we do communion. He told his disciples that they were going to have to drink from the same cup that he did. Folks, that's the cup we're going to have to drink from. And it's full of the blood of Christ. Not only the suffering and the shame, but also the power. So Brother Tommy, I'm going to ask you to lead us in a prayer. And if you'll just thank the Lord for the shed blood of Christ and the fact that we have the opportunity to partake in it. Not just once at salvation, but folks, our whole life, that we can be covered in it. That's something to thank him for today. Go ahead, brother. Our Father in heaven, whose love, whose grace, and whose mercy covers all our sins, Lord. Lord, we thank you, God, so much for that. We thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. Yes. The blood of the Savior, Father, who cleanses the blood of God. Yes. We love you, Lord. We just thank you for everyone here, Lord. We just thank you for the many blessings of life you just uh, give us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to search you, search your ways, God, search your word, your problems, our daily lives, God. Lord, we love you. And we can't say that enough. We give you enough thanks, Lord, for all your gifts that you've done for us in our life, Lord. We continue to praise your name, raise it up high, because you are the King of Kings. Yes. Lord, Lord. Amen. And Lord, we're on your word. Lord, we love you. We love everyone here, Lord. And we just lift everybody here up to you. Praise your name today and forever. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen. 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 Honey, grab Ashley and take her back. All right, we want y'all to give this young lady the right hand of Christian fellowship on your way out today. Uh, remember, uh, come and join us tonight if at all possible. We're going uh, to have some worship tonight. So y'all come on and uh, be a part of that and support your church. And we're just going to have a good time in the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right.